standing by the side of the road holding up a sign that reads, the end is near. Turn around now before it's too late. A passing driver yells, you guys are nuts. He speeds right past him. And from around the bend, they hear screeching tires and a big splash. And the priest turns to the pastor and says, do you think we should have just put up a sign that says bridge out instead? <laughs> we live in strange times. Maybe the strangest it's been on the earth. Strange. You know, most of what's in on the political scene causes us to worry. We feel threatened by the, what we see going on, by the news, by the alphabet things. You know what I'm talking about when I say that. Mm -hmm. Alphabet. Okay. Evil's being treated as virtue and vice versa. It's upside down. It's crazy. Enough, us, enough to cause us to be worried, you know, concerned. But Psalm 119, 76 says, May your unfailing love be my comfort according to your promise to your servant. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, this morning we do need comfort. And we are the only thing that can bring comfort to this crazy world. And we just ask that uh, these words of yours will go to where you want them to go and will cause what you want them to cause. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in Genesis chapter, chapter 12, first five verses, it says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Verse 4, So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. So Abram, who was later called Abraham, but Abram was facing a tremendous change. Change is unpleasant. We don't like change. That's why you all sit the same place. <laughs> we don't want it. We don't like change. We don't like it. There's usually an element of pain in change. Even if it's just, I'm uncomfortable. I don't like this. Change is, is not, it's unpleasant. I, uh, the change in me, I can't remember anything anymore. That's a change. I'm 76. I guess I'm not supposed to remember everything. But I have a challenge with remembering things. Or I remember things real clearly, but wrong. That one can get you into more trouble <laughs> than just not being able to remember. So getting older is a change. You can't put the brakes on. You can't stop it. It's a change, and it has its challenges. It's the ultimate challenge, I think, the ultimate one I've ever faced. But we all like our comfort zone. We like to be settled in, comfortable. We like to know what's expected, and we like to know what to expect. But change is necessary. Growth is change. Stagnation results when there is no growth change. You know, if you, if you plant a tree and you water it and you expect it to grow and then produce fruit, well, that's a change. It's not going to stay a little stick. It has to change. It has to grow up. <laughs> 
Growing up isn't a whole lot of fun. Uh, I'm not looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> But if the change comes as an obedient and obedience to God's directive, there will be blessings in it. Abram was directed to leave all that he knew and all that he was familiar with. Go, God said, go. In other words, get away from the land that you know. Get away from the people that you know. Get away from the culture that you know. 75 years in a culture, he was steeped in it. But you're supposed to, you now have to get out of there and go to a place I will show you. Get completely away from everything that you're comfortable with. How many of us would, how many of us would do that? <laughs> At 75. How many of us would do that? And it continues, to a land I will show you. Not a land uh, that you see or, or have seen, but a land that you have never seen. That you do not know. A land I will show you. In other words, a new territory. Abram had no idea what the people of the land were like. He didn't know what their language was like. He didn't know what their customs would be like. Or how he and his family would be treated. Or how they would get along if they would find pasture for the flocks and herds they took with them. He didn't know. But he just went because God said, go. That was faith. That was moving out by faith. Contingent upon his obedience was a fourfold promise. A, I will make you into a great nation. But you gotta go. He was 75 and had no children uh, with his wife Sarah. B, I will bless you, but you gotta go. C, I will make your name great, but you gotta go. And D, you will be a blessing, but you gotta go. All those promises are contingent upon him uprooting himself and getting out of there and obeying, obeying and going. He had to proceed based only on what God promised. He didn't see the land. He didn't know the people. And he didn't have children. Why would Abram believe God? Why would he believe it? He was only a shepherd. The Bible hadn't been written. The only holy words he knew were the words God spoke into him. I will make you into a great nation. Didn't have any kids. And he was already 75 years old. I will bless you. Yeah, right. Send me away from my family and everything I know in the natural. How would there be blessings in that? I will make your name great. Yeah, right. No one will even know me there. <laughs> so how's my name going to be great? You will be a blessing. So how am I going to do that? I don't even know if I can survive where you are sending me. Those were, are the natural responses that we might have. Why did God choose Abram? God knows who he can count on. He knew Abram would do it. Faith is the test. God said, go, and Abram went. God enables those whom he chooses. If he chooses you to do a thing, he will enable you to do it. God enables those who will accept his challenges. We show God that we can depend that he can depend on us by our faith. God had a plan. He was going to establish a race and a culture that the Messiah would come into and come from. That's how it was that he would bless, that he would be a blessing. Abraham, or Abram at that time, 
and those with him embraced a tremendous change. In order to accomplish God's purposes, to show their obedience, they would strike out and go where he said to go, his, where he directed. They would leave their comfort zone behind. We all have comfort zones. Like I said, that's why you always sit in the same place. It's a comfort zone. We don't like to be discomforted. Look at the dramatic change that Saul went through. Saul. His comfort zone was as a Pharisee and as a persecutor of the Christian movement, the Christian church. And then God got his attention. He said, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus. And as a result of God's word that came to him, he got way out of his comfort zone. Paul became probably the greatest evangelist that ever lived. He wrote a large part of the New Testament. And how about a guy, a little short guy, sitting at a table collecting taxes. This guy was despised because he was what they call a publican. In other words, he was the agent of the Romans, and he made money by siphoning off the taxes that he was charging the people. And uh, his comfort zone was at his tax table. Dishonest gain was his way of life. He, was a, he lived a comfortable life because he was an agent of the Romans in, in collecting taxes from his own people. His life was totally changed when Jesus called him out of the tree. He was sitting at the tax table. Then he heard Jesus was coming in a crowd, and he wanted to see this guy, Jesus. He heard about him, so he climbed up in a tree because he was so short. He got up in a tree, and Jesus stopped, and he said, Zacchaeus, come down from there. <laughs> I must go to your house today. Here it is in Luke chapter 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He is going to be the guest of a sinner, referring to Jesus going to Zacchaeus as a, as a guest. But Zacchaeus stood up. See, Zacchaeus was down, then he was up in a tree. Then Jesus called him down, so he was crouching because he jumped out of the tree. And then he stood up. I had a, a, I preached a sermon, it was called The Ups and Downs of Zacchaeus. But he stood up then, and he said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. So repentance came. Total change. His comfort zone was his tax table. His wealth was gained at the expense of his own countrymen. But now in repentance, he emerges from his comfort zone. He wasn't in a comfort zone in the tree, only at the table. <laughs> But he came to Jesus, and salvation came to his household. Jesus said to him in verse 9, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So, so, so Zacchaeus was a lost soul, but he was a comfortable one, because his comfort zone was making money from other people. But Jesus changed all that. He got out of his comfort zone. He went up in a tree. Then he came down in front of Jesus. Then he invited Jesus to come to his house. And he got, and he got saved. 
We are, by nature, comfort zone creatures. We like our favorite recliner. That's the only time when nothing hurts in a recliner. <laughs> We have favorite shoes that we can wear all day. I can't wear these cowboy boots all day. They hurt my feet. I can't wear them all day. I wear sandals. In the wintertime, if it's not mucky outside, I wear them even outside. I wear sandals because they're comfortable. Some people prefer to be barefoot. <laughs> I remember when I was in business and photographing the, the kids, the teenagers, and I had a I had a background that, that I built. It looked like a log cabin. It had log cabin siding, had a doorway in it, and a deck at the bottom of it. And uh, the kids, especially bald eagle kids, they loved that background because it was so outdoorsy, you know. But I could remember saying uh, to the girls, "Shoes are optional." And sometimes I had to duck because there'd be a flying shoe going through my camera room. They wanted a barefoot look in front of that, you know, sitting down on that deck thing in front of the cabin. So some prefer to be barefoot. No normal, no normal person chooses discomfort. God came to us in the person of Jesus, the Son, to accomplish his purpose, he had to leave his eternal comfort zone. He had to leave it. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was, a, was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He was with God, and he was God. He came from his place in glory, was, ma was made lower than the angels. He took on human form. Talk about leaving your comfort zone. There was a purpose in that. In order to be effective in what he came to do, he had to be extreme in his willingness to be out of the comfort zone, the eternal comfort zone. Just imagine, the only way for you and I to be rescued, to be set free from the law of sin and death, was for him to become the ultimate sacrifice, to endure pain and suffering, to allow his shed blood in the most horrible and humiliating way because he loved us. Amen. Jesus went to extremes to bring his light into dark places in people's hearts and lives. And that includes everybody in here. So should we not also emerge from the comfort zone in order to be effective in carrying the gospel? Church can easily be a comfort zone. Many come just to feel good in church. We like to do things in the way we always did them. <laughs> we like to sing familiar songs, sit where we always sit. Some churches don't dare change anything. I remember when we first started going to the Assembly of God Church where we got saved. This was up in Hartford, Connecticut. And back in those days, they sang a couple choruses, and then they had an offering and announcements. Then they worshiped from a hymnal, always from a hymnal. The pastor played a piano, and another guy played, a, somebody else played an organ. And uh, they did that. And then the sermon, then the altar call, and then a pastor went to the back of the church and shook hands with all the people as they were leaving. It was a pattern. They always followed, always. It was a comfort zone. We're like that too. We sing three, three um, praise songs, then offering. Well, I open with a prelude, and then we have an opening scripture. Then we do three. 
praise songs, then we do offering and announcements, and, and sometimes we pray for people at that time, sometimes we do communion at that time, and then we have three worship songs, then the sermon, and then we go away. <laughs> it's a pattern. It's a comfort zone. It's just a pattern. What if we did it backwards? What if we, what if we, what if we had the end of the sermon first? <laughs> I mean, the service first. What if we, what if we had the prelude at the end and had the opening at the end? Turn it all upside down. You'd all go crazy. I would go crazy. <laughs> But this church has something the world needs. The gospel. This church needs to prosper. Talking about prosper, prosperity in souls. There are plenty of sinners around here. So we have a responsibility. You know, we might have to get out of our comfort zone in order to be effective for God. If you see somebody somewhere that's hurting and the Lord speaks into your spirit, so go talk to that person right away. You know, who, me? You know. But the Holy Spirit strengthens you to actually do that. And I've had an opportunity to pray for people in a store. I just ask them, what's happening? You're limping around. What happened to you? And sometimes, and I say, can I pray for you? Sometimes they say yes, and sometimes, well, only one time a guy said no. He said only once. Most of the time, of course, if the Holy Spirit doesn't speak and say do that, then I don't do it. It's the same way with witnessing for salvation. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's a, that's a growth, that's a, a renewing, a different thing, a different attitude. Not the old mindset, but a new one. The Holy Spirit does that. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. The renewing of your mind is a change. It means not thinking the way you always did, Maybe God wants you to do something different. We all need to be involved in sharing the gospel. Pastor can't do it alone because he doesn't go to work with you. He doesn't live in your neighborhood. You have a mission field. So learn to be a soul winner. Learn salvation scriptures. Be spirit-filled. That's how you get the boldness to overcome that shy, that shy in a way. Be spirit-filled. That brings you the boldness to go where you never went before. And then do everything God's way. How do we find out what's His way? <laughs> it's all written down in the Word. Proverbs 3, 5 to 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Get out of your comfort zone, your own understanding, your own ideas. They might not be in line with what God wants you to do today. In all your ways, verse 6, submit to Him, and He will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. So we need to think of ways to be more effective, both personally and as a church. This year, in 2022, as a pastor, I was really blessed. I was able to lead nine people to the Lord. Three of them were at a funeral. One of them was at the decedent that was in that funeral. Actually, when you think about it, every one of those people was somehow connected to Teresa. All nine of them. And, not, and they're not here. They don't live here. But they're all connected to Teresa. The two kids that we baptized, and then their parents got saved. That's four right there. The funeral was her uh, ex-husband. 
that's five. There were three. There were three saved in uh, in that funeral. There may have been more. That's eight. And a ninth one. Where was the ninth one? I know there was a ninth one. I know there was. I can't remember. There was, though. It wasn't here. People don't get saved at altar calls in church anymore. It's one on one. Oh, I know. I know where the other one was. Yeah. And you ask a question after you share the scriptures and you say, Do you want to do that? And yes, I do. Those are the three words every soul winner wants to hear. Yes, I do. And then you can lead them in a, in a prayer. It's so exciting to bring somebody out of the darkness into the kingdom of God. It's just unbelievable. First year I was here, nine people. The second year, two people. The third year, two people. The fourth year, one. In 2022, nine people. Nine. So we'll see what this year brings. God brings them. I'm going to talk to them. What about you? God brings somebody your way that's in, had, in any kind of trouble or downtrodden about something or other, hurting. Those are usually the people that you can bring to the Lord. And they're everywhere. You work with them. You're their neighbors. You run across them. You just have to be willing to get involved and do it. Learn salvation scriptures and get comfortable with a form of the sinner's prayer. And you can do it. You just have to get out of the comfort zone. Amen? All right, would you stand? God, our Father, we come before you with grateful hearts that you allowed that you allowed this word to go forth, and I pray that it will seed itself way deep in all of our hearts, Lord. Make soul winners out of all of us, Lord. That's our responsibility. And, Lord, we look for a harvest. We look for a harvest of souls, of prosperity and souls in this church as this year continues. And uh, we ask your blessings once again on all those who are not here because of illness. We ask your blessings on those that are, that are here, um, that are ailing in any way. We just ask your blessings and your healing virtues to flow. We ask you to, uh, to dismiss us in your grace. Bring us all back safely next time we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor, I hate to see you